Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Photonics Lecture Series by IEEE Photonics Malaysia. I am Dr. Nadia Husaini Zainal Abidin and I will be your moderator for this session. So we have a very exciting topic today which is state of the art, deep ultraviolet generation and its challenges and it will be given, this talk will be given by Dr. Muhammad Imran Mustafa bin Abdul Kudus, which is with us today. He's already here. So before we start, before I hand over the stage to him, let me read up his biography so we can get to know him a little bit more. So Dr. Imran received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from Imperial College London, which was in 2010, and his Master's Physics degree from University College London in 2011. He then did his PhD degree in optoelectronics at the Optoelectronics Research Center, University of Southampton in 2016 on UV generation in solid core optical fibers. And then currently he is the senior lecturer at the Department of Physics Faculty of Science, University Malaya. His research interests include nonlinear fiber optics, uh, optical fiber resonators and optical fiber sensors and also DUV light sources. So I hand over the stage to Dr. Imran and I'm very excited to listen to this. Okay, over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Assalamualaikum and good morning to everyone. Thanks very much for coming. Um, so uh, this talk is like, um, it's just going to be a run through of what I actually have been doing for the past close to 10 years by now. Um, and the stumbling blocks that um, we've kind of um, met and, and the problems that exist, as it were. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm just gonna write, uh, drive, drive right through it. Um, so why, firstly, why do we wanna do something like um, UV generation? And the reason is, it might not be that clear, but um, the UV range goes from between 200 nanometers to 400 nanometers. Typically, um, the range of interest uh, currently, at, le at least for something like COVID-19, would be the pur pu uh, water purification and um, uh, uh, sanitization uh, sort of um, application, where the target wavelength is about uh, 260 nanometers. We also have things like uh, UV curing which is fairly uh, ubiquitous, and that's 300-something um, nanometers. Lithography and uh, normal lithography, not the lithography that's used in, in making chips and stuff like that, um, and, and other kind of uh, applications that exist. Now, um, generally, OK, so um, this is kind of why we want to do it. And the way this, this talk will be structured is essentially we're going to talk about um, you know, the, the, how we make light and then what sources exist for this UV range um, and then why the, why the, there's problems with them and and what we've done um, to kind of alleviate the the kind of problems which exist, right? Okay, so light generation you can think of it in in basically three ways. You can have a chemical process, um, you know, when you mix two chemicals and it lights up. For instance, you can have photo uh, electroluminescence, converting electricity into light, or you can have photoluminescence, which is converting uh, light into a different kind of light, so different wavelengths of light. So generally, you know, chemical process, including combustion, right? Uh, and then um, we have electroluminescence, typically a discharge. So your um, your Pendafloor uh, lamp uh, bulb is a discharge tube of sorts. Um, uh, neon lights are also discharge based. Um, and uh, more uh, normally would be something like uh, a diode. So uh, LEDs, light emitting diodes, as well as laser diodes um, are ubiquitous in, in, in normal life. Even the you know, the, the, the first um, sort of commercial use of LED, no, not one of the first commercial use of uh, infrared LEDs are in, in remote controls, for instance, right? And then we have uh, photoluminescence, which is essentially made up of generally two things. You can either have fluorescence, which is when you, you shoot at a wave, uh, light at a, a bluer light to get red, uh, red, which is redder in color, or wavelength conversion. Wavelength conversion, there's multiple parts of it, and we'll, we'll talk about it in, in more detail in, in the, in the um, Ensuing um, in the talk, right? So essentially, if you for things that we can actually control, we go from electroluminescence to photoluminescence, um, in the sense of uh, fluorescence, and then normally nonlinear optical methods. Um, so that's kind of how. So in order for you to get our nonlinear optical methods, typically you would use something like photoluminescence 
to get the necessary conditions out. And the electroluminescence kind of pumps everything out. Um, so for photoluminescence and electro, uh, electroluminescence, what is important then is the band gap or the energy level. So electroluminescence, typically we'll talk about the band gap when we talk about diodes and we talk about energy levels when you talk about something like a discharge tube or something like that. And photoluminescence typically would just be energy levels because that will be the intrinsic energy levels of stuff which we dope into the material itself. So for instance, our, our telecoms uses erbium doped fibers as their amplifiers. And so the energy levels are determined by the energy levels of the erbium uh, ions themselves. And for, so for UV wavelengths, then the band gap or the energy level that we're looking at has to be between 3.1 to 6.12 EV, so for the 200 to 400 nanometer range. So this is a bit, so the reason I'm kind of um, talking about this is because there's actually very few materials which have those properties. And so this kind of limits what we can kind of use for you, uh, light generation in the UV. Now, so the first thing about UV is everything absorbs in the UV. It's one of the worst places that, um, um, you know, like to work in the UV means that you have to know a lot about loss. And you can see here between 200 nanometers to 400 nanometers, um, you know, below 300, the loss just becomes terrible. This is for silica, by the way, um, uh, pure silica. Uh, and so the loss in U the UV is actually not that bad. Um, if you take something like plastic, it doesn't really transmit beyond 400 nanometers so um you know you you gen uh, so for something like uh, if you if you want to some amplify for instance light then what you what you want is to have the output power in, in uh, here uh, where g, g here is just your the gain the output power at the end of it must be able to be higher than your loss right and um because it's really lossy what that means is um Extracting light is actually quite difficult um, because, you know, it, if it hits something which has a high loss, um, then you can't use it anymore, right? Or, or you, you, you lose some of the light coming out. These are the traditional methods that we've used um, for light generation, so UV LEDs, uh, algan based typically. Uh, laser diodes, gan, gallium nitride based laser diodes typically are limited to 375, and that's because of their band gap, potentially, right? Um, and then we have uh, discharge lamps, so for instance, um, uh, mercury vapor. So this is so uh, for like uh, sanitation purposes, the most uh, uh, widely applied um, systems are discharge lamps. And typically they, they are like high pressure or low pressure uh, mercury lamps, um, which are like, you know, like pulled into a, a certain kind of configuration, then just, just used as for um, for uh, to, to sanitize stuff. We have excited dimers, excimers, laser sources. Um, these are, you know, just um, gases, for instance. Also ion lasers, gas lasers, free electron lasers, a bit more complicated, but essentially, you know, you, you control the, the um, excitation, uh, sorry, the, 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 the flow of electron energy of the electrons. Uh, and then um, in the um, more kind of laser side of it, uh, we have uh, nonlinear frequency conversion. So this takes um, wavelengths, uh, light at a longer wavelength, so red light as it were, and transfer it to the UV. Um, uh, so typically you have ND, titanium sapphire, and then use um, uh, some crystals such as BBO, LBO. So this is barium uh, borate oxide, LBO is lithium borate oxide and stuff like that. Typically, even in the labs that we use, uh, normally it's BBO uh, or LBO, depending on how much money you have and how, how critical the applications are, stuff like that. We, get, we, do, we do also have solid state bulk lasers. Um, so for instance, based on cerium dope crystals, um, this is slightly more tricky um, to, to work with because cerium has a low band gap. But, uh, so this is similar in, in a sense to um, solid state lasers. Um, but this, uh, yeah, so this is um, less, um, less commercial, so shall we say. So typically you can have something like EL, uh, electroluminescence here and then PL here. The problem with these systems is typically they are expensive, they're difficult to maintain, and a lot of optical components bulky. I mean, the, it's not like a comprehensive list. For instance, you know, like um, mercury vapor um, is mercury vapor. And so you can't, you know, if it hits something and it breaks apart, then it's mercury around, right? So it's fairly dangerous. Uh, something like the nonlinear frequency conversion has multiple optical components, and it's fairly sensitive to, um, to um, uh, alignment. 
Uh, normally, if we use these sort of things, um, you, you sort of have to check the alignment every now and then. Typically, you'll check it between like a month and three months or something along those lines in order to make to make ensure that everything is aligned properly and kind of having that uh, maximum efficiency is possible. So, in, so we want to get away from that and just have something like a turnkey. So you turn it on and then it's going to work. In those cases, then really we want to do something like UV LEDs or we want to do something like um, nonlinear um, solid core fibers. So solid core fibers meaning it's the same fibers that we use in, your, in our internet, has high power lasers. And we just splice it. So it's the same process as, you know, just taking two pieces of the glass and then just sort of uh, fusing them, them together and it doesn't break. It doesn't break, right? And so that's like the, the easiest way of getting these, well, of, of, doing, of doing these things. Microstructured optical fibers um, is an option in a sense. Um, the problem is that just still um, launching light into the fiber still takes time and there's, other issues to consider um, as well. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, but not so much because um, no one really does a lot of it um, now um, at this point because there's uh, certain limitations. They're kind of used in, in different applications. So I think uh, British Telecom is trialing um, and uh, a microstructured optical fiber opt uh, telecommunications link and stuff like that. Not so much in the, um, in the uh, UV generation space as it were, although they, 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 they can be used for that. On-chip waveguides also exist. Uh, typically from what I, well, I, I don't know too much about this. The problem is mainly with loss. So I think at least Dr. Fidaus in, in, in U, is it U, 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 M or something? He used to be in Southampton. Um, he used to use something like uh, tantalum pentaoxide and that works in the UV. So he, he was doing something along those lines in on-chip waveguides. Um, other than that, we can we can dope um, uh, active materials into into our fibers. In which case, we have to look at the D, so-called DK diagram, and this is active gain media. So what that is is we we we, we so for instance we're changing the erbium inside the optical fibers, which we use in in um, telecommunications, um, to something like jame uh, gadolinium, right? So we'll see why we have to use gadolinium. In terms of uh, deep UV devices, really, we there's there's not that many um, devices which which can which we can use, and so only these these three are kind of uh, suitable in a sense for DUV devices: aluminium, gallium uh, nitride, diamond, or zinc oxide. Right? Okay, so. Um, Okay, so uh, we'll look at optical, nonlinear optical methods first, and then we'll go on to uh, DUV devices. And so the point here is that we, I, I wanted, well, we want to show that um, it's actually impossible to to have really high efficiencies, but we'll, we'll go on to that, um, you know, at some point. So nonlinear optical effects, just as a kind of um, review, um, can be divided into parametric and non-parametric. Actually, there's a bit more division, but for for the purposes of this. Um, this is what we, we, we care about. So parametric uh, it means it's energy preserving. Photons come in equals photons coming out. Non-parametric means photons coming in, some transfer into um, uh, phonons, which are uh, vibrations, right? Uh, and then some uh, goes into photons as well, right? Or take, take energy from phonons. So in those cases, you have second order, third order, um, parametric um, kind of uh, processes as well as Brulein and Raman. These are just uh, different kind of phonons. So Brulein is uh, acoustic phonons and Raman is uh, optical phonons. Um, the diff there's some, there's like fundamental differences between them, but they just have a shift in the frequency um, range uh, as it were. Now, um, if, you, if you have second order or, or third order uh, uh, nonlinearity non plus something like Raman and you're shooting you're using really short wavelengths of light, you can get something called supercontinuum generation. I'm just pulling this in. It's because something like supercontinuum generation allows the generation of the UV in the UV. The problem is it's really broad. So you shoot, in this case, I think they shot it at 800 nanometers or close to 800 nanometers, and then they get this sort of broad wavelength range. So this covers from, you know, this is 200 to about 1600. Um, so it, it works. Um, it's just that for like, um, you know, um, for UV specific UV generation, if we only care about a specific wavelength, this is really not efficient. And, and we, we don't really want to use something like this um, for UV generation. Okay. So then, uh, in, so uh, we have 
parametric optical, optical nonlinearity, which is the most useful one because non-parametric, typically the shift in the wavelength is really quite small. And so, um, and it's actually quite difficult to control as well um, <clears throat> in a certain sense. Um, so we want a parametric non uh, optical nonlinearity. The, diff the main difference between second order and third order is that second order is dependent on the crystal structure. So it has to be crystal, whereas the third order works with um, something, you know, like just isotropic materials, like glass or an any kind of um, uh, you know, dielectric, essentially. So a third order nonlinearity always kind of exists. Second order depends on the crystal structure, right? And so um, for something like silica, we can't have, um, you know, it, 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 we, we will be using third order. Now, normally we would say that you have face match and non face matched. What that means is that something which is non face match will always be there. It will always exist. And something which, sorry, yeah, non face match will always uh, occur um, regardless of where. Um, so if you shoot light in and you have third order linearity, the power can. Uh, the power is sufficient for third order linearity, then you will get self face modulation and cross face modulation. Um, self face modulation kind of means that um, it's um, it's uh, the the wavelength is um, interacting with itself, the pulse is interacting with itself, and cross face typically means it's interacting between two different wavelengths, but um, not in a um, yeah it. it um, it's not in a constructive kind of manner and as it was you can't really transfer energy in, in a very efficient way so what you want is really face match so all of the nonlinear processes which uses crystals and stuff like this use face matched um uh processes in order to transfer energy efficiently from one wavelength to another wavelength so if you've heard of something like second harmonic generation using um you know like a crystal like bbo or lbo or uh, what else uh, uh ppl uh, ppl uh, Periodically pulled lithium niobate PPLN. So all of them use um, second second harmonic uh, generation. Sometimes they use different frequency generation. Um, that's just different schemes. It's not really that important. Um, the the point is that the way these things work is essentially having the wavelengths which are interacting in a sense, kind of walking together. So they they are, they are moving kind of. They are kind of moving in the same kind of speed. And when, because they are moving in the same kind of speed, it allows transfer from one and it, uh, one wavelength to uh, the other the wavelength. So that's uh, it. And because it's face matched, as well, you can kind of you you sort of control the interaction length and how much interaction. So um, interaction length in such a way that you you maximally transfer energy from one wavelength to the other wavelength. So that's kind of the idea. So it, it works with second uh, second order and third order generation. Now, as I said before, in isotropic materials, meaning something which doesn't have a crystalline structure, right? it, isotropic means it looks the same everywhere, right? So on average, the it, it looks like the same everywhere, essentially. So this is dimin diminishingly small. Uh, we do get this sometimes in like, so if you have something like a microfiber, which we'll talk a bit later, um, the, because the microfiber is so small, you do get some, uh, some uh, effects from the edges, but typically it's really very small. Um, so you don't really get this in, in something like silica um, or even tantalum dioxide, something along those lines. <clears throat> um, so we, we we'll talk about third um, third order gen, uh, processes more, specifically third harmonic generation and for mixing. Okay, okay. So for all fibers, this is like the the goal, as it were, all fiber UV generation. So we we uh, we will we will do nonlinear optical methods and rare earth dope silica, specifically get the linear dope silica. Okay, so we've seen this before. The the thing that I've used at least is this thing, which is called an optical microfiber. Uh, this is for nonlinear optics. Uh, the reason this is done is because um, it has large mode confinement. It has a high nonlinearity and it ha it has tailable dispersion. Uh, the the second part is really important. So the the actual nonlinearity of the system, of the material is actually quite high as compared to like normal silica because um, it's small. So the, the diameter of this is of the order of one micron and smaller, right? Uh, two microns, one microns and smaller. So it's really smaller. All of the light goes into a really small area. So it, it kind of, it allows high nonlinearity. Tailorable dispersion, what that means is we can kind of um, sh uh, change um, the speed at which different wavelengths of light travel inside the material itself. 
and th that's why it's called trailable dispersion because it's tailorable then we sh we are able to match the speeds of one wavelength to another wavelength essentially right okay so this is a uh, so in optical fibers you have these modes what the modes are is essentially just um the solutions to maxwell's equations in a uh in a specific geometry so if you solve maxwell's equations in something like a uh, cylindrical geometry uh, you will get modes which are dependent on things like the wavelength of the light the uh, the refractive index of the materials as well as the um the um, the diameter of this fiber and it's a numerical solution, which means as you go up in, so if you change the wavelength, for instance, you will get different kinds of modes. So it, it's something like the harmonic inside of a guitar string. It, it's something like that. So um, it, it's not the same, but it's, it's something like that. And so um, you get like different kinds of modes. And, the, uh, and if you think about this, if you want to transfer energy, so this is like the fundamental mode from say the picture in the top right, uh, left corner, so if all of the power is in is in A, for instance, you can see that the intensity is highest at the center, which means it will most likely be most efficient if it transfers energy into B, because this the intensity is also highest at the center. So it's, it physically overlaps, which means it's going to be able to transfer most all of the energy from the center to, to here. So that's that's called a modal overlap. And uh, this will be important later, but you can see that you know if A transfers it, it its energy to 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 C it won't be that efficient because there's nothing really in in C in in the center right whereas all of, most of the power is in in the center here. Um, in in the case of optical microfibers, generally the outside is going to be air, which means the nonlinearity is actually quite low. So we only look at uh, the the sort of middle um, center of the this this thing here. Okay. So first we look at uh, harmonic generation. So a third harmonic generation. So a third harmonic generation is in in. in uh, Sim simply is that you're you're converting um, wave uh, power from a wavelength of lambda at a wavelength of lambda to lambda over three. So if you have a wavelength of 900, you're converting 900 to 300. If you're at 1550, you're converting to 550. Right? It requires phase matching, as we said before. This is just the condition of the phase matching. It just means that you know th this is the condition um, for which it, the the the, the um, waves will quote unquote travel together. Right? Um, in the case of uh, optical microfibers, um, you can you cannot. Um, the, uh, that's called fundamental mode. The fundamental mode, um, because um, it's going to, it's going to look about the same, right? So it, the modal overlap is maximal in the fu fundamental mode. The problem is because of something called dispersion, then um, you, you can't do that. So you you, you go to on. A higher order mode, which is called inter intermodal phase matching. Um, so the efficiency can be calculated by this um, coupled equation, right? A, uh, one is just um, wavelength one, and three is just the generated wavelength. So this one is your pump wavelength, the three is your generated wavelength. SPM is self phase modulation. So this is on uh, XPM is uh, cross phase modulation. So these two will always exist, as I said before. And then you have the energy transfer term at, at the end of this. So this actually uh, determines the transfer of energy from one wavelength to another wavelength. J, the J's are just um, modal overlaps, as it were. Not really that important. Uh, actually, quite important for efficiency. But I mean, um, you know. Um, and this final bit, I actually this should be delta beta. This is um, the um, the uh, the phasing. Uh, what is it called? The phase matching condition, right? So. You can calculate this and get nice graphs like this, and you know you can say, well, in theory, that you can get you know more than 80 percent conversion and stuff like this. So uh, the guy who did this um, first, Grubsky, in 2005, he published a paper. You know, he said he he came out with this sort of graph, and then he did show you know you can get like close to 100 percent efficiency if you use this method. Um, but you can see that it's kind of um, really sensitive to detuning. If you go to slightly all, if it's slightly detuned, then it goes to you know like only twenty five percent, and this this will be fairly significant later on. But I mean, it looks nice, and so like we did efficient uh, some experiments, uh, and what happened was um, since two thousand and five, um, several groups in uh, have were pursuing this. So it was in Southampton, there was another one in France, and I think there was another one 
I remember which one. Um, in I think in China, I can't remember. But um, no one was able to get efficiencies more than uh one percent. So it's like really bad, right? Um, and so when it, when I came in, everyone kind of knew that there was some issues with the uh, um efficiencies. Um, and so doing the experiments again, we, we we basically got the same results. And what we did was we looked at um what the limiting factor is actually is. So what we did was we looked at um, the um, surface roughness of the optical microfiber itself. And then, so what it is, is essentially, if you have, if you, now, if you're pulling a fiber, right, it's glass. Glass has a large processing temperature. You've seen people play with glass before, um, I'm assuming, at least. Um, and um, in, in, in those kind of cases, um, you know, um, you can, um, can have glass which is like um, fairly hot but you can still like shape it right now if you pull glass and then you sort of cool it immediately what happens is the vibrations inside uh, in the glass itself gets trapped uh, of the phonons get trapped and the trapping of these phonons create um, constitute the surface roughness as it were of the material itself They've, um, so uh, people in Bath, for instance, have measured this, or they measured this in, in, uh, in microstructured fibers, and we basically use the spectral density frequency um, of these uh, surface waves, uh, randomizing it um, to make it more realistic, and then essentially uh, putting it as a condition in this part. So we put it as a condition in, in the uh, phase matching part. And what happened was when we did that was no matter how you do it, you will never be able to get efficiencies beyond 1%, right? So in this case, it's like 0.35% is the maximum before which it's just going to peter out. So that was what kind of explained what happened um, in, in, in this system, right? And so um, I was like uh, d devastated and um, I'm still trying to do the experiments to finish my PhD. And then we found like, we found uh, wavelengths coming out. When we were doing the experiment, we found wavelengths which, which were coming out, which was really weird. We, we didn't expect those wavelengths. And we, we, when we did the analysis, it turned out to be Fourier mixing. And so Fourier mixing is something similar to third harmonic generation. The main difference being that you have you know, these two pump photons creating these two other uh, signal and idle photons. So you have interaction between these two pump photons creating idle and signal photons. Uh, the pump photons can be um, the same photon. So lambda, one, lambda two can be equal to lambda three. Um, uh, so it must, the, the main thing is that you have to, it has to be energy conserving. Omega two plus omega three must be equal to omega four plus omega one, right? From E equals H bar omega, which is from uh, Einstein. And then it has to face match. So this is just the conditions, and you can find the face matching conditions um, as it were. These were the wavelengths that we were using, but you can generalize it for one pump or two pumps and stuff like this. So we found okay, so it's possible. Uh, again, you can you can go back to the um, original sort of derivations um, for uh, nonlinear optics uh, in optical fibers, and then kind of calculate what the efficiency is going to be. So that's actually so this is like this. It's a set of four equations um, uh, because there's four, uh, four uh, wavelengths interacting, and then kind of you know putting everything into um, uh, into into all of this. Uh, the, the, uh, this symbol here just is just a uh, modal overlap. So again, you have similar kind of um, uh, expressions: surface modulation, cross surface modulation, and your energy transfer equation. Um, and then we did this. Uh, we did the experiment. Actually, we did the experiment first, and then sort of formalized it because weird things were happening, right? Which we didn't understand. So what we did was this is a so-called uh, MOPA, Master Oscillator Optical Parametric Amplifier, which simply means we it's a high power laser, relatively high power laser at one specific wavelength, which has, um, so when I was using it, it has, an, uh, it has a peak power of 500 nanometers and, so, sorry, 500 watts with a full width of max of, of less than 0 .0, 0 .0, 0, uh, 0 0.1 nanometer. So it's, it's really quite small. Um, so that allows us to do this um, investigation. So we have two optical microfibers. One is for, for mixing at 516 and the other one's for UV generation. Um, and so we, you know, <clears throat> if when we do the experiment and we, so this is, um, we took this, uh, the, the measurement 
as we are making the optical microfiber. So um, as we were making it, we can see. So we, we basically heat up the fiber and then pull it. And while we were pulling it, we were taking the, the measurements in. And so we, um, we can see that at a certain diameter, this wavelength at 387 came up, right? And, and at uh, about 900, and yeah, 900 nanometers, 700 nanometers, you can see peaks which correspond to uh, fourth, the fourth harmonic of the 1550 pump that we were using. So the seed laser was at 1550 in the telecoms region. Uh, and then we were getting 387, which, which was uh, the fourth harmonic. And we were getting the fifth harmonic here, 310. So this was like good, but the, and then um, my junior uh, continued this to get the sixth harmonic. Um, so she was doing uh, 250. Oh uh, yeah, the fifth harmonic um, with for mixing, I think it was. Uh, sorry, with uh, third harmonic generation. Um, the problem is, as I said, uh, the problem is still the same. The the main issue is you, you see this is the main the, the the main chain, right? And then you have this thing which is called the periodically pulled silica fiber. This is a fibrous material um, uh, device which allows us to do second harmonic generation. I'm not going to go through the details um, um, of this, but um, the issue is the, uh, the 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 transfer of energy from from the, the 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 main pump to the second harmonic is already like the maximum that they've they've able to achieve is 40 percent, and then transferring it to the uh, third harmonic at 517 ish, um, it's not efficient as well. So transferring a bit more to the fourth harmonic will be terrible. So essentially, it, the, the efficiencies I think I calculated is like really, really, really low. And so it's like a fairly bad way of making UV. But I mean, we, we did get results. Um, it's just not efficient. So we, we've shown that this was possible. It's, it's just not efficient. Um, while we were doing that, we were also looking at um, gadolinium dope fibers because we weren't sure with that, you know, there were issues with the third harmonic. So we looked at gadolinium dope fiber. And the reason we looked at gadolinium is because um, the it can laze, as it were, at uh, 0.31. So the reason you want to put something like red earth dope rather than something like uh, zinc oxide is actually zinc oxide is a semiconductor and it doesn't blend really well in, in, in glass. So typically we will put, you know, something like red earth dope silica. As comparison, you have erbium dope and thulium and ytterbium. These are more sort of commercial and, and uh, normal kind of infrared radiation that we we are most used with. One, uh, the ytterbium dope is is mostly used for high power lasers, right? Erbium is in telecoms, and thulium is currently um, being investigated for two microns and above. Sometimes they co-dope it with erbium and uh, or ytterbium stuff like that. But essentially, it's the same scheme. Only really gadolinium has this wave uh, the 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 energy level that we need, and so we doped it. So this is the initial experiment. We have a pump and as you can see, we pumped it at 257-ish. We got a signal as we uh, uh, like we wanted to. And then, um, so I didn't do this, but um, uh, some people in the silica fab group, um, they made uh, phosphosilicate fibers, which are gadolinium dope. So it's uh, it's silica doped with phosphorus, doped with co-doped with gadolinium. And the reason you need the phosphorus is to break the gadolinium up and to increase the refractive index a little bit to make it guiding. And so, you know, we got like these results. So the results are fairly good at 310 nanometers. You can see, you know, that's like some intensities uh, coming out. The problem was that getting limb dope um, fibers, um, the, there's two main issues. The first one is that the absorption, absorption cross-section is quite low. Second one is that the lifetime is quite short. What that means is it's difficult to absorb uh, UV light, right? And then when it does absorb UV light, it, it fluoresces really quickly, which means that making a laser out of that is fa actually fairly difficult. Um, and so I think after the funding for this uh, ran out, um, I don't think it was continued. Um, serum serum gadolinium dope is, was used um, for nuclear um, research, but I, I'm not sure if it's still being used. But essentially, um, you know, there, there's limitations that I don't, I don't think we've thought about how to kind of improve on that, uh, as it were. Maybe this will be revisited, but at, at this point, I think everyone sort of gave up on this. Okay, so as a side, you can also use uh, my op microstructured optical fibers. You can divide microstructured optical fibers to three types, you have protonic crystal, holocore, and suspended core. For these three types, you can always use do supercontinuum generation. In holocore, there's, um, there's a bit of a... So nowadays, people are trying to use it with gases, 
So for for like um, non-resonant um, fibers, um, so they they they're putting non non-resonant fibers. It's a type of holocore fiber. It's it's like something like G. G is something like a non-resonant holocore fiber. A is something like Kagome fibers, and this can be used for telecom um, telecom uh, applications. So they can they can put gas in, and then I've seen people sort of doing discharge in uh, inside an holocore. So the the reason you want to do that that is if you can you can put like mirrors at the end, then you can have a really compact uh, kind of laser and the problem with like normal um gas lasers right is that the gas the, the cavity is kind of everything's uh, solid state uh, everything is kind of limited to the length of the mirror cavity that you can make if you can if you can put gas inside the colocor put put like um mirrors at the end right um the holocore fiber can be like really long like three or four kilometers or something like that right so you can like put all of gas in discharge all of it i don't know what the limitations are because i haven't actually looked at, at this um well ha the, it's not really that in, in in style as it were as of now and then kind of you know like have a really large gain and then have a good good output at the end so i think uh, there's some movements towards that um if, if uh from what i've read um but nothing's um nothing really um extensive right um so um whether or not we um I, we can probably do that here in Malaysia because Prof Rafiq in 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 UM uh, at least well his lab at least um, he's in now in USM but um, his his lab can make these holocore fibers um, so that might be something which we we may revisit um, the problem is that this research tends to be a bit more expensive because the tubes are expensive so we'll see whether or not we can get funding for that another way is uh, suspended core so you can see that this is the course uh, there's three spokes of this suspended core fiber they can be four spokes it can be five five spokes of this fiber this fiber has a small core which means uh, you can have really high nonlinearity so that they have been investigated because they have high nonlinearities um, we've tried looking into doing third harmonic generation on this. Um, the problem is it doesn't phase match like at all. So um, that might not be possible. I have, I've broached the subject with my old, my supervisor, with, uh, well, my ex-supervisor, whether or not we can use it for foil mixing, but the, there's other issues with things like um, launching light into the suspended core fibers and stuff like that, um, which meant we, we didn't really look into it. So this is a possibility which may, we may look into in the future. As of now, I don't think anyone's using it. I think there are several groups which are working on this. One in, I know, in, in Auckland, uh, sorry, in, uh, what is it, in Australia. Oh, I can't remember the name of the university now, which is bad. Um, uh, I think uh, this, I think a group in Poland which is doing this as well, um, and, and some, some other stuff, um, some other groups. Um, Bath, I think, oh, Bath is not doing this. Maybe Germany's, it's, it's not really in, in style as, as it were because there's issues with um, with doing this. So um, that's kind of um, like, um, you know, like the limit of, of doing the, these sort of stuff. Um, we may be able to do this, but we'll, we'll see what, what can be done as, as it were. Okay, so uh, um, the other part of this is when I came back, um, the lasers went there, um, the, the stuff, went, and well, nothing, nothing really was there. So, um, decided I, I still like um, deep UV. And so we looked at um, Dr. Swami was around and he was doing some, well, still is around. And he's, 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 he's doing um, gallium gel nitride stuff. And I knew that, you know, aluminum nitride is able to make UV, uh, deep UV devices. And so, you know, I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll have a look at deep UV devices. Um, and so uh, we, we uh, this is just uh, some history, um, fairly badly, uh, taken picture a few years ago of the first all Malaysian made LED. So we, we made, you know, epitaxy fabrication and packaging, maybe not packaging, but at least epitaxy and fabrication in, in Malaysia. And this was part of the uh, Gan on Gan uh, project, which was in collaboration with Ostrom um, and USM as well um, for this project. So it was uh, to make blue LEDs uh, as well, but um, uh, now, now we, we're moving to other stuff, including um, red LEDs, uh, UV LEDs. Uh, USM, USM is leading the, UV LEDs as, as it were, but uh, we, we have some, some stuff into it. Okay, so in terms of materials for semiconductors, we really only have three, as I said before, aluminum gallium nitride, diamond, and zinc oxide. Um, so all of this have issues. Zinc oxide, people looked into it. The main issue is P-type doping. So a lot of people kind of didn't, didn't really look into it properly. Uh, well, kind of abandoned for a lot of industrials uh, related stuff. 
there's still a lot of work on zinc oxide nanostructures. Uh, I think Dr. Maria may, gave a talk about zinc oxide nano uh, random lasers, and, and this uses zinc oxide. Uh, so it, 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 for research purposes, uh, there's some work on it, but um, uh, you don't really get right um, a lot of industrial uh, interest in zinc oxide. Diamond, possible. The problem is, uh, and commercial LEDs for diamond exist. The problem is fabrication, right? I mean, difficult to make diamond, expensive as well um because it's just carbon right um so it has a high band gap so there's issues with fabrication as well as doping remember that ultimately when when we're talking about semiconductor dv devices it's it's essentially a pn junction right so you have to have an n type and you have to have p type no matter what you do so you 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 will have to dope it right um and so if you have issues with with doping then you're, you're kind of stuck in in a sense right so aluminium gallium nitride is the most popular option um, the main part, the main reason is, well, one of the main reasons is that it has a variable band gap because you can change, uh, aluminum gallium nitride is an alloy, meaning you, you're, you're going to change the composition between the aluminum and the gallium, right? So the, the different, uh, so aluminum can be say 20% and gallium can be like 80%, will have a different wavelength, uh, emission wavelength, if, if for instance, uh, compared to something like when aluminum has 40%, is 40%, right? So the variable band gap is good um, and uh, for different applications. Um, and so um, it, it's kind of um, what you want, essentially. So again, uh, LEDs are just PN junctions. Um, laser diodes are still PN junctions, right? It's just a laser, right? So this is kind of, so you have a depletion region. Nowadays, you normally have something uh, at least uh, you have multiple quantum wells, as it were, right? So these are quantum wells that we teach in class, which exist, um, which we can fabricate in, in our labs. Um, so th this is an old one. So this is aluminum gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide quantum wells. This is a uh, infrared LED, right? And it would have a metal kind of um, uh, interface. Uh, sometimes you have an insulator. Typically, you would, have, you would also have a current spreading layer, at least for um, nitride LEDs and that's because of the the uh, mobility of the uh, <clears throat> of the p type um, of the p type uh, nit nitride semiconductor but it, it, it's just kind of the basic structure so again if you look at why aluminum gallium nitride based LEDs um, the band gap is like you have two types of um, uh, nitrides right you have zinc blend and woodzite zinc blend is not really that stable so normally we we'd go as woodzite um, gallium nitride has a has three, what's the three point, I can't remember, three, 3.25-ish, uh, 3 how was it? I should know this, I can't remember. But aluminum nitride, uh, uh, yeah, 3.5 um, uh, uh, energy, energy band gap. And aluminum, you can change that within this this region, right, by alloying it. So you can also put some some amount of indium and then, and then move in, in this kind of region. So this sort of uh, triangle-ish kind of shape is uh, where inside of it, is where you can change the composition between aluminium, gallium, and indium uh, nitrite. Um, the main issue with doing that is really, you know, the, the growth windows, as it were. Aluminium likes high temperatures. Indium doesn't like high temperatures. So, you know, they tend to work against one another. So you need to do some, some clever engineering to kind of work, work with that. So aluminium, gallium, nitrite has high thermal conductivity. Relatively, um, gallium nitrite have, have, is okay. Aluminum nitrate is actually not that, it's actually quite bad. Um, but anyway, um, relatively high thermal conductivity, high melting points, which means it, it, it normally doesn't fail. Actually, I was talking to Dr. Swami yesterday. If you have like, no, it, these days, if, if you have, you know, um, if your bulb, if your LED bulb dies, it's not because the gallium nitrate dies. It's actually because the ACDC converter dies. And that's normally because of your, um, uh, what is it called? Um, the, um, uh, capacitor so normally the the point of failure is is the capacitor not uh, your gallium nitride your gallium nitride is fine especially the larger like units if you have like a discrete box for your acdc converter normally it will pop like the cheaper ones you, you hear a pop when 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 they when they when they die right and that's just because of the capacitor anyway so no it, it actually is really good right in, in in a very real sense so um so yeah it has white buying grab, white spectrum, and, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, why we use it. Okay, so in terms of key parameters, this is um, fairly standard. Um, when we talk about efficiencies, we have uh, four types of efficiencies, as it were. The ones that we most care about are two, wall plug efficiency and external quantum efficiency. 
So wall plug efficiency is given by this power out divided by the power in, power out meaning the light power out and power in meaning the electrical power in, right? And this is just equals to the uh, external quantum efficiency multiplied by the photon energy divided by the um, power, uh, The this is the energy of uh, an electron <clears throat> as it were, right? So this is the energy of electron, this is the energy of a photon. So obviously external quantum efficiency is important. External quantum efficiency is um, has three parts. You have injection efficiency, you have radiative recombination efficiency, and you have light extraction efficiency, right? Injection efficiency and radiative re recombination efficiency is normally can be lumped into something called a, uh, internal quantum efficiency, eta IQE, internal quantum efficiency, uh, and multiplied by the light extraction efficiency, you get um, uh, external quantum efficiency. The reason you want to lump these two is essentially because these two are kind of related to your electrons and how the electrons, how how much electrons you have and recombining into photons, right? And light extraction efficiency is how much of the photon that actually you can make it uh, exit your device and it's usable, right? So that's that's the logic behind behind this, this uh, division, right? Uh, so uh, in, Injection efficiency is related to the uh, charge carriers, which actually reach the quantum well. So remember, I've talked about in, in earlier that um, everything goes into the quantum well, right? And so how much of it actually goes into the com uh, quantum well is the injection efficiency. Um, uh, some of it, uh, uh, um, some of it go like there's loss because of, you know, like uh, it gets trapped in um, dislocations and stuff like that. And so uh, that, that, that causes a loss in injection efficiency, but you can make it quite high. Um, but radiative, uh, and then how much of these electrons actually recombines with holes, uh, makes it a radiate uh, and create light is the radiative recombination efficiency. You can get like re uh, combination, uh, uh, you know, um, recombinations which are non-radiative, um, right? Uh, for some reason, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, but you, you do get that as well. And, and how much light actually comes out from the uh, com uh, recombinations is the radiative recombination efficiencies. And how much light you can actually extract is called the light extraction efficiency, obviously, right? So one um, is related to crystal quality, injection efficiency, right? Um, <clears throat> and also your doping. Um, re radiative recombination efficiency related to doping and activation of your, of your, of your dopants. Right and uh, uh, light extraction efficiency is related to geometric optics uh, absorption as well as TE and TM modes. Um, TE and TM modes are actually more important in in UV LEDs compared to um, nitride LEDs um, because it changes um, with uh, aluminium aluminium concentration. Uh, anyway, uh, okay, so this is just a graph of um, what has been achieved, right? Um, this is the newest one, and this is the best one in this, the region that we are most interested in. These ones, you can see here, the ones above 10%, is mostly, a lot of it is just gallium nitride. These ones are aluminium and gallium nitride. You can see that most of the effort is actually in 260 nanometers, uh, and thereabouts, 270, 260 nanometers. And this is because this is the, uh, the, 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 the wavelength which is most useful for steril sterilization, right? So really only... Um, Rican has done this, and this was done, I think, I believe in 2018. No one has supported it since. Before that, there was uh, something else, um, which was at 10%. Uh, some people have, I think it was Nietzsche, but I can't remember exactly. But, you know, some people have reached 10%. This is external quantum efficiency, by the way. This is not even like, uh, yeah, this is external quantum efficiency. The best is 10%. This is not even wall plot efficiency, right? Um, um, and I know some people don't trust, like, uh, this number. Um, let's, uh, so there's like some disagreement whether or not there's not that number is uh, is true, but let, let's just say that number is correct, right? Um, I think uh, nowadays um, you, you do you do get uh, you know like uh, people in um, uh, uh, you know uh, people getting like ten percent out. Um, so and so I mean this is moving there, but there's still issues to be dealt with. Um, the thing about uh, the one uh, the uh, what Rican did was that they used really kind of out of like really unusual materials to get this and so um it's it's not really that um it's not that commercial as it were if, if you think about this like really weird uh, metals and stuff like that but i mean it, it seems possible right so what's the problem the problem is this <laughs> so many problems um 
at each stage of this, there's issues, right? And so you have low resistance UV reflective P contacts. Normally, to get um, you, you don't get good contacts with uh, aluminum gallium nitride. That's the main problem. So normally, at the top, you will have a gallium nitride cap, and gallium nitride absorbs UV, and so you get like some loss because of this cap. Um, and you, you, and the other thing is you. In, in, in gallium nitride LEDs, you have the um, the uh, in, indium tin oxide ITO layer, which is the current spreading layer. ITO absorbs be, uh, be below 400. ITO absorbs like crazy, so you can't use ITO. And so, like, um, yeah, so so there's like issues there as well. Um, then um, in the uh, low uh, to get like low resistance UV uh, P transparent layers and inject high uh, efficient carrier injection is also a, a, a big problem because you get a lot of leakages, right? Um, uh, high EQE is a problem. Uh, carrier confinement is a, is a big problem because um, you know like a, a lot of problems. Um, um, activation of P-type, the P-type gallium nitride is uh, algan is also quite low, um, in uh, like only a few percent, if that, right? In in the P-type, um, so efficient, uh, efficient current spreading in the N, N algan is a problem. Uh, below this is all about uh, crystal quality, right? So uh, heat extraction is a problem as well. Um, aluminium gallium. So th this, uh, this, these, these, these three are uh, has have to do with um, the um, quality of the crystal, and you have heat extraction for high power is is a problem. So because uh, aluminium nitride is not as well, uh, uh, well, uh, algan as well. The substrate is typically uh, sapphire, right? So you have to to if the okay. So if the efficiency is low, it will go into heat, right? Which means you have more heat to deal with than you do in something like gallium nitride, which is more efficient, right? So you, you have to think about the efficiency, uh, the, the, the heat extraction as well, okay? Uh, this is uh, just a schematic of, your, of, the, um, of, of a flip chip um, uh, 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 deep UV LED. So flip chip meaning, so we grow from the substrate upwards, right? And then what they do is they, they dice it and then they flip it over. Um, and so you have a sub mount and then you have your, your uh, N-type uh, contact, which is this one, and then your P-type contact, and uh, P-metal, and then your argon and, and stuff like that. This is your actual ID. Uh, this, uh, the QW is actually here, right? So this is like how it, it's going to, to work. What you want is all of the light actually is, all of the light is generated here, but you can see that, you know, you have electrons coming in. A lot of it will, will actually leak out, right? And then it's going to, some of it will, will like recombine in the PR algan as well, not just the MQW, and then some of it will leak as well, right? So what you want is you want to kind of keep all of the electrons here, uh, in, in here, right? And all of the holes in, in here, and then kind of force them um, to, to recombine, even if you don't have that many holes. So you have to like increase the number of holes, and then you have to keep the electrons in the holes together and kind of push the electron, um, like, Keep the electrons so that they don't they they recombine and make light, right? Uh, yeah, all good recombinations. <laughs> the, the the thing that I forgot. But. So uh, yeah, this is the same thing that I was talking about. Low electron hole uh, function overlap is something which I didn't talk about. Essentially, what happens here is that um, because uh, 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 nitrites are polarized, what happens is you get a polarizing effect where the holes are actually in one side and they have uh, electro electrons inside this quantum well. The holes uh, is actually on the right-hand side and the electrons are actually, uh, sorry, left-hand side and the electrons are on the right-hand side and that overlap is uh, reduces um, the, um, the uh, efficiency of in the MQW. This is a well-known uh, problem um, and it's well-known even in, 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 you know, like indium gallium nitride LEDs and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, um, these, this, I mean, it, it's there's a lot of stuff to do. Uh, so with the remaining time, um, I'm just going to talk about the the um, three issues and then what people have done. Right? I think I have about three minutes, so hopefully, it'll be, it'll be okay. Uh, so issue one is crystal quality. You can see that if uh, you have a lot of dislocation, um, the internal quantum efficiency drops precipitously. Right? This is a log scale. Right? So be, we what we really want is one. Uh, 10 to the 8, right, per cm squared, dislocation and, and, and below. Uh, this is like, this is not really a problem with uh, gallium nitride, uh, like blue LEDs. It's a bit of more problem with aluminum nitride. Um, and for this, people have done, you know, things like uh, ELO. So this is uh, epitaxial lateral overgrowth. Where you have, so what you do is you have like a substrate which is cut in this manner. 
and then you grow on top and you get these uh, structures out because and then you can see you see this they, these lines are all um, defects right these are all the de dislocations uh, and because you're doing that then you can kind of you know like make it fairly flat and fairly kind of um, you, you can bend the dislocation using things like um, super lattices and stuff like that which I think is in in here so this is a super lattice to kind of remove the the strain, uh, reduce the strain and stuff like that. So uh, another way is by using, um, uh, so to remove the dislocation density, you can use uh, migration enhanced epitaxy or pulse atomic layer epitaxy pale. So this is the approach that we've used as well. Um, so what you do is you pulse, so when you're making this, you you have gas precursor gases, and what you do is you you pulse one of the gases. In this case, you pulse the ammonia, so the TMA, uh, trimethyl aluminum, um, is the precursor gas that you need for, for aluminum nitride. Uh, so the aluminum comes from this and the nitrogen comes from ammonia, right? So you pulse your ammonia. And because you pulse your ammonia, um, you know, you can make, so initially it creates these, um, these nucleation growth. And then um, because it comes, you know, like that, uh, there's, there's a mechanism to it essentially, but um, you, you can make the dislocations kind of disappear or make it lesser uh, as, as you grow uh, thicker and thicker and thicker. Right. Obviously, you can kind of uh, you can kind of use ELO on this, for instance. So you can use uh, sapphire substrate, which is like this. And this is what this, this group have done. So they've done, you know, like um, uh, ELO on on using um, migration enhanced epitaxy. Right. So you, um, it, the the results are, are fairly good. Um, so uh, nowadays, uh, it's also um, fashion. Uh, the fashion, not fashion, like. Uh, there's also movement to do the so-called face-to-face annealing. What it is is you stop you you have a sapphire substrate and then you you sputter it on top. You you sputter aluminium nitrate on top, and then you put like either sapphire or on, uh, you 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 put like uh, again a uh, sputtered aluminium nitrate uh, on sapphire. You put it in together. You put it um, in uh, nitrogen-rich uh, ambient at about 100, uh, 1600 or seven, 1700 uh, degrees C and leave it for like eight hours or something, right? Really long time. And what happens is um, because you have this interface, it kind of uh, fixes the interface and, and you, you get an improvement in the um, crystal quality. So this is um, relatively, not, not really, but relatively new, about three, four years um, that we've seen a lot of this coming out since 2018-ish. Uh, this has been taken up uh, by you know Chinese uh, researchers, Japanese re researchers. Not so much in in Europe, uh, it seems, um, and 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 the US. But that, that's a lot of stuff. So the idea is that you you uh, sputtering is a cheaper way of making you know like growing growing uh, aluminium nitride even at the nucleation layer is is fairly expensive, uh, and so sputtering is cheaper. So so you want to the idea is you know you have this cheap. Um, uh, cheap method of making aluminum nitrite, make the aluminum nitrite really nice and then grow on top of that. Um, so that's um, another way, another uh, another method is to make aluminum nitrite uh, substrates. Uh, those things tend to be astronomically expensive. So um, like very few people are doing that, but there's some people are, who are working on that. Uh, another uh, issue is current injection. So um, this is because of, for instance, the, high, the, the uh, magnesium acceptor level. So this is a, uh, 510 MeV is above the valence band edge, for instance. So the activation is actually quite small as well, because also the mobility is also quite small at higher um, currents and stuff like that. So that's you know a lot of problems. Um, people have tried. So with regard, so the bigger problem I think that people um, think needs to be solved is the um, p-type, right? Um, and and also confining the electrons into the MQW. So th these are the two things. So uh, to to increase the number of, of um, holes which are available, um, they've used tunnel junctions, right? So tunnel junctions um, is when you can't see it here, but essentially because of the way this this works and because of the uh, polarization, you create holes at the interface between uh, INGAN here and ALGAN. So in between this interface, you create holes, right? And you can you can like push those holes into the quantum well. So that's a pop popular technique uh, to uh, for for uh, to, to to improve the uh, amount of um, uh, holes in in the p p gan right p l gan. Um, uh, so another way is to kind of play around with your electron uh, blocking layer. You have you normally have electron blocking layer. So to basically to to stop the electrons from 
from just going just straight out into the p-type right you have an electron blocking layer and uh, you have different kinds of electron blocking layer normally like you just have a bulk electron blocking layer they've played with graded composition so you you change the composition of your uh, ebl like so or you can have super lattice ebl or chirped uh, uh, and be a uh, multi-quantum barrier electron blocking layer <laughs> is what this is right um these techniques tend to be um they, they they're quite good the the, the issue is that something like super lattice ebl or chip uh ebl requires very precise control over your um your layers as it were uh they do work um and uh but but it does again it, it requires precise control especially if it's chirped and you have to like calculate it properly right um so you can see here right uh yeah it shows here that this this tilt this is an mqw uh, quantum well uh and this tilt is really because of the polarization you can see so if you think about the holes most of the hole is actually here most of the electrons is here and they don't want to meet right so that's another problem so that's why among other things that's one of the reasons why you need uh, ebl so in terms of light extraction um so light extraction uh there's less work on it because um there's not much light to be extracted uh well not not true but um you have issues between te and tm mode so if you have um higher content of aluminium in your quantum well which is um uh, uh yeah higher content of aluminium then it becomes tm mode tm is transverse magnetic which is up uh, so the electric field is in a different direction is oscillating in a different direction so um you kind of so if it's like 50 50 then you have to think about how you want to design your your cavity your your um, what is it called your your led uh, some people have used this kind of strange structure kind of way, way right they put aluminum mirrors and magnesium fluoride oh, magnesium fluoride is um is uh transparent so that's good and at, uh, down to 200 so that that's good Right, so they've also used like different kind of structures. So they've they've normally what they do is just roughen the structure up, like this, right? So they roughen the structure, and then then do some other stuff. So this is just to improve like light circulation. You can see it's not very clear here, and apologies for that. But you can see you have structures here, and structures here, and structures in both of them, right? And so the idea is that you can you can so this is a photonic crystal. They they did a photonic crystal on this, um, and and so. Um, you can see that the reason they do this is to kind of coax some of this TE and TM light out, as it were, um, to, to improve the light efficient uh, extraction efficiency. This is a so uh, this is like another method, as it were. This is uh, uh, using core shell nanowires, right? Um, a li little bit out there, right? Not that many people. Well, uh, that's not true. Uh, some people are doing this. Um, the, the main issue is, you know, like you, you, it's difficult to interface with. Like, if you think about your LEDs as just being something like this, right? If you have, you know, some, some like these nano structures, which are really small, right? It's, it's fairly tricky to kind of uh, work with them uh, on a large scale. Um, and so, like this approach um, is not that popular in industry. And, and groups which are more inclined to industry, because there are groups which are more inclined, less inclined to industry. Uh, and so, but but they they do work and 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 if you do something like this, um, the advantage is you know um, you don't get like dislocation. Like dislocation is really small on this. The, you have other problems, but the dislocation is small, right? So it's one of the options. Uh, so what we've done is we've done pulse growth just to round this out. I know I'm I'm out of time. Um, so we've done um, pulse uh, growth uh, of taxi. Um, so it kind of works, uh, but we are only here. Um, the student, uh, Nazri, who was doing this, uh, completed his PhD and is now in uh, Osram. Um, uh, uh, and so we need to do this. So there's lots of stuff needs to be done. Uh, we need students and we need some funding for the students. Uh, we have funding for, for some other stuff. But uh, yeah, so that's what we've done. This is what we want to do. I think we've been asking for money for a long time for to, to do UV. Um, the problem is, the main issue is that um, before COVID, no one really cared. After COVID, everyone wanted fast results, which means, you know, like this sort of thing is not something which you can solve in like a year or two. It requires a lot of attention um, and a lot of understanding to do this. Um, and uh, hopefully USM has done a lot more uh, on this and they uh, have been very consistent um, on doing, you know, UV stuff. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get uh, more activity on UV generation. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's about it. 
thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, and apologies for for over. Uh, it's more than eleven now, right? <laughs> I don't have. <laughs> no worries about it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Imran. A very very um, packed uh, talk just now. So if I may allow the audience to ask any questions, if you have any. Does anyone have any questions? You may unmute yourself and ask your direct, your questions. No questions from the audience? Okay. <laughs> um, let me... Um, so, Dr. Imran, um, what, which part of the your work is, like, the most difficult for, for you to get um, results? Like, on the laser part or... Like there was like a um, laser that you showed just now, right? I'm more familiar with lasers and not so much on LEDs. So you, the fabrication part is like the most taxing part or like constructing, like getting the efficiency itself. Right. Okay. So, so like, are the, it's like different kind of difficulties in a sense. So um, something like growth, um, the m main issue is that, you know, it's, it's the, the uh, the resources are fairly limited, so we have limited growth times, and we 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 kind of have limited, uh, you know, like stuff. So um, you know, uh, TM, uh, all of these precursors are quite expensive, and so it, it's it's kind of limited um, to 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 what we we, we uh, to, uh, the main problem is that you know we don't have that many students working on this, and so even if we have like. Um, the 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 time which we normally don't have, um, then um, you know, no one's working on this. We, we, so 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 that has been a, um, a uh, challenge. I think for us um, the main challenge has been to secure funding for students to run this project. Um, uh, we've only really done like one one only Nazri does this um, in a sense. Um, and the technique, the, the, the pulse growth technique is being used in other places. But specifically for UV, there's not been that many. Um, with regards to la the laser, the, the, the issue, I think, is that uh, high power lasers are fairly, the components, okay, so the components are quite expensive. And um, they tend to break down a lot, right? <laughs> So like I have a, I, I know like a friend of mine or one of my senior who, who was working for a project um, high power lasers. I think his modulator breaks like every three months or so, and that like requires retuning and stuff like that. And you go, I don't really want to do this. So um, getting the efficiency um, is is one of them. What one one of the problems? But but really we you know like it, it's really these other problems um, which we have to deal with. Um, but I think yeah uh, if 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 um, if anyone is interested um, or to collaborate or anything like that, that um, we do like we do have these projects on, and we have a second MOCVD which should be turning on fairly soon. The, uh, we need like the engineers to come in, and uh, that second MOCVD should be able to do what USM is doing. So the the, the issue, or well, one of the reasons why we did pulse growth is because um, the the our our, our um, reactor cannot go to the temperatures which aluminium nitrate should be grown at uh, if best grown at and so pulse growth allows us to reduce the temperature but the new reactor that we have uh, that is should be coming in online soon hopefully um uh, is capable of those temperatures so we should be able to get um you know like work done on the uv um in the near future um if we can if we can secure funding for students um these other stuff we can probably get, uh, we can probably uh, turn around stuff. But yeah, students are uh, kind of what we, we are lacking at the moment. Yeah, if that answers the question. <laughs> it does, yeah. thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Hi, Dr. Hi. Shremi here. Hi. It's fine. <laughs> so uh, Imran, and can you comment on uh, uh, where we are uh, or yeah, in this uh, UV um, uh, fiber or UV uh, generation, so, UV lasers, so where we are in the world. Okay, um, the main groups who are doing this, and uh, well, the, the main two groups who are doing this, uh, well, not the main two groups, let's say the main two nations who are doing this, 
consistently is the US, uh, sorry, is, uh, is Japan and Germany. So they've been like the leaders for a while. Germany, Queso, um, and um, US, like um, Amano, uh, Hirayaki, uh, what is his name? I don't know. Um, so that's like, um, and then uh, the US, I think they had a strong program before they stopped that, and then they kind of, is uh, they, they, they are bringing up that up again. China is uh, coming up. So we know that Xiamen has a strong, is, is trying to create a strong um, uh, program for UV stuff and they've been publishing and, and there's research. Um, in Malaysia, so people who do UV, there's only two types, right? Like <laughs> really, so there's like, People who are like uh, USM and UM who are doing, who are trying to do UV LEDs, and we've—I don't think we've had like a full-fledged UV LED um, from Apitaxi to fabrication done. I—I I, I, don't—I don't think so. USM may have one, but I, uh, at least in UM we don't have one. Um, and the people who and the other uh, kind of people are people who do zinc oxide, but people who do zinc oxide. Um, you know, people like uh, Dr. Maria, uh, they do it for random lasers rather than for like UV generation in, in, in the sense for LEDs. So we are really quite far back, right, for, for UV stuff. Um, and it, it's quite a shame because I've been telling people, you know, if you do UV stuff, 10 years from now, you still have stuff to do. <laughs> There's just so many stuff to be done um, that, you know, it's, it's just not going to be solved. A lot of it won't be solved. Um, and I think if we get, so I think that the, the, if someone is able to make really good UV LEDs, right, um, that will be the spot to all, a lot of other stuff. Because, um, so for instance, um, I've spoken to uh, some people who make drones and they were saying, you know, UV, um, UV, uh, UV light is really useful for something like uh, mine detection. So if you have landmines, right, you shoot UV LEDs and you, you collect the back, uh, the, the, the resulting emission, um, you put it on a drone and you can sweep like a field with really easily, right? The problem is that UV light is generally inefficient. And so if someone is able to make a really efficient LED UV, then, you know, you can put it on these drones and you can mine sweep automatically, right? You can automate the process really easily. Um, there's also some, some uh, and then you, you can do some, some other stuff with like non, non line of sight communication. Um, Li-Fi is non-line of sight communication in, in in a sense, so you can do some stuff with LAN, not not for Li-Fi, but for like jets and stuff like that. So yeah, we 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 um, if you look at the projections for UV, uh, I think with in in the next within the next five to ten years there will be a leap in terms of the efficiency because uh, with COVID, the US government has pledged some money. Uh, we know that US government has pledged some money and people around the world have realized, you know, that these traditional methods are inefficient and they are kind of dangerous in the sense it's not really that scalable. You can't make it small, right? So you can't have just a lamp uh, of the UV and then just use it as an LED or something else. Like it doesn't work. <clears throat> and so um, there's a lot more effort into it. I think, I'm not sure about the Japanese government, but I know that the US government has pledged a large amount of money. So I believe that in the next five to 10, ten years, the, the efficiencies will increase at least more than, to more than 20%. And when it does, um, you know, and it becomes cheap, um, you will see, uh, we will see a lot of applications in the UV. Uh, and if we, if we don't build the capacity up now, because this is like in another 10 years, right? If we don't build up the capacity now, then it's, we will probably like get left out like we did with something like silicon photonics because um, silicon photonics is, is, you know, there's like commercial stuff going on with silicon photonics as well. Anyway, um, that's, uh, I guess, my comment, if, that, <laughs> if that's okay. Thanks, Imran. Any other questions from the audience? No more? Okay, um, so I think we're going to end it here. And can we take a group photo before we officially close the session? Is that okay with everyone? Can you guys turn on your video cameras? How do I turn? Oh, my camera died for some reason. I don't know why. Give me a sec. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. How do I 
view this in tile. Change layout, tile. Okay, so I can see everyone now. Okay, I'm gonna take a picture of everyone. Give me your best smile. I'm gonna say one, two, three in a bit. Okay, one, two, smile. Okay, one more slide. One, two, smile. Okay, thank you so much everyone for coming. I hope you will uh, come to the future uh, photonic lecture series. We have more coming for, the, for this year. So keep a lookout for that and I'll see you around. Bye-bye, take care. Thanks a lot, Dr. Imran. Oh, uh, thanks, sorry. Bye. Thank you, Imran, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Amir. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Hello.